One of the things that uh, one of the things that I sort of always uh, never hear at WordCamps is sort of the theory behind why uh, why people develop WordPress themes or plugins, or at least the uh, methodology by which they should. And so I was going to spend some time mostly in that, and then we'll sort of get into uh, sort of the applications and, and some of the actual like development best uh, practices. So a little, about, uh, a little bit about me. My name is uh, George Ortiz, and I run a company called Press Trends. And I uh, started it uh, earlier this year, and we basically do uh, data ad uh, analytics and aggregation for WordPress developers, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, content creators. And uh, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so best practices. I split this up into sort of two parts. The first is we're going to talk about the approach or otherwise sort of the methodology by which you guys should approach developing these themes and plugins. Now, I just got to preface this with this talk is primarily uh, for people who develop themes and plugins for other people, not necessarily I have a company who uh, their site is built on WordPress and we do internal plugins. Um, I'm not really talking to you. Um, I'm sure you can get some stuff out of it, but I just want to make sure that, that that's sort of where I'm coming from. Uh, that's where I spent most of my time. That's where I got introduced to WordPress. Um, and I think a lot of people, at least the majority of the population of WordPress developers, uh, they develop themes and plugins with the intent that other people are going to use them, right? A lot of times it, it comes out of a, a sort of a self uh, need. Uh, we say, man, I wish WordPress did this. Oh, the great thing is I can develop a plugin. And so they do that, and then other people use it. Um, and it's just the nature of the open source community. So getting into it, best practices, uh, sort of how we ought to approach it. The first one is this, develop with passion. I've seen so many themes and plugins that look like they were developed uh, in just a few hours. And, and you know, we might be getting to a stage where you can develop really quality themes and plugins in that time frame. But for the most part, people are just slapping stuff together. They're not focusing on standards. They're not focusing on the right way to do this. And they're not even thinking about the end user. And the only way, or the only sort of understanding approach that I can see why people would do this is that they're not passionate about what they're doing. That when they set out to do something, that they're just saying, you know, I just want to try this out and, and see what works. So, you know, I'm all about testing. But first and foremost, if you're going to spend your life doing something, especially in an open source uh, environment, make sure that you're passionate about it. And start every project, every theme, every plugin with this in mind. Make sure you're passionate about what you're doing. If you don't care about doing travel blogs, don't build travel blog themes. They're going to be terrible, and no one's going to use them. <laughs> the next thing is this, focus on the user experience. Not enough developers do this. Uh, I think you know, somewhat designers tend to focus on this a little bit more because the users are sort of uh, interacting with the front end, and that's the stuff that they experience. But you guys have to understand that the code behind it is just as much uh, a part of the overall user experience. And especially when you're developing themes and plugins that are being used uh, by people who are maybe developers, or you know, maybe a 13-year-old boy living in the Bronx who just installed uh, WordPress and he's blogging for the first time. Like you have to understand sort of who you're developing for and, and, and focus on the user experience. So going back and, and, and just to give you a little bit of insight, with Press Trends, we have access to um, around 200,000 uh, WordPress sites and growing all around the world used by over 800 developers, uh, you know, submitting and tracking themes and plugins. And so we, we know what themes are performing well. We know the right way to code uh, in, in terms of to set up the user experience. And this is sort of where we're at right now. 57% of the time uh, when people activate a theme, they deactivate it within 30 days. 57% of the time. That means half the, half the people that use your theme are going to deactivate it within 30 days. Like, that's crazy. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a talk that Matt Mullenweg gave at, at the State of the Word uh, earlier <coughs> this year, and he was talking about, look, the problem uh, you know, with, with, uh, with WordPress is still, you know, as much as people say it's easy to use, the attrition rate and the, the amount of time that people use WordPress 
or install it or set up a WordPress.com blog and then pretty much never do anything with it is still relatively high. And so this is why you've noticed that in WordPress core, they've introduced sort of the getting started page anytime you activate it for the first time or, or you do an upgrade. And for developers, we're still kind of meh. You know what I mean? As long as people download our themes or as long as people are using it or as long as we get paid, whatever. That's where sort of the, uh, the buck stops. That's where our you know, sort of attention to detail or, or, or our passion ends. And this is, this is insanely high, 57%. Now the interesting thing is that for plugins, it's actually a little bit lower. It's 32%, which you know, I mean, isn't that bad? And and so we've tried to basically understand some of the reasons why this is. And so we've looked at you know the differences obviously between themes and plugins. Plugins traditionally, uh, they they do what they say they're going to do, right? If it's uh, comment on Facebook, it usually does that, right? It might not be developed as well as, as uh, you know, maybe another one, so it might get a low rating, but at the end of the day, it still does what it does. Let me ask you guys a question. How many of you have installed a, a theme uh, because you thought the demo was awesome? Great. And then after installing that theme, you realize, holy crap, there's a million options in here, and I, I don't even know how the developer set up that demo. Yeah, it's insanely hard because, you know, we, we want to put in all these options and, and we want to think through things, but at the end of the day, we're not focusing on the end user experience. So, with that, don't bloat your settings and options. Whether it's a plugin, or it's a, a, a premium theme or a theme that you're uploading to WordPress.org, don't bloat your options. You don't need 50 different color settings or style sheets. You, you just don't need it. People, at the end of the day, want to install and activate a theme and continue with their WordPress experience. You guys have to understand, for the majority of people, the, the primary reason and, and the beauty of WordPress is that it gets them publishing content quickly, quickly. They don't want to spend time setting up all of these different uh, custom theme options. Uh, they just want to get to publishing their content. <coughs> so don't bloat your settings and options page. Uh, the other thing is this. Minimize the steps it takes to set up your theme. Minimize the steps it takes to uh, get the plugin set up. And you, don't, you can still offer a very rich feature set within your themes and plugins. But try to approach it from the, from the standpoint that if I'm a user, I don't want to have to see uh, a, a page of all of these uh, you know, steps that I have to do in order to set things up. You can gradually walk through users uh, you know, setting up, OK, you need to set up your home page, you need to set up uh, your uh, you know, portfolio page, or this is you know, sort of uh, some custom post types that we have for integrating a slider. But don't. Focus on just throwing a bunch of steps at people. Make it as simple as possible to get them publishing or get them utilizing the main function of your plugin. The next thing is this. Understand who you're developing for. So <coughs> one of the things going forward is when you're developing for yourself, you don't really care about updates. You don't really care about all of the settings. You don't, you understand what the purpose of, of, of the plugin is for, or what the purpose of the theme is for. You're putting in just enough options, I guess, to, to get the job done. But like I said at, at the beginning, the, the whole point of WordPress is the community. And you have to understand that a lot of the themes and the plugins that you're creating are going to be used by other people. And so when you're doing that, understand that you're not just developing uh, you know, for developers, that you're developing for people who are brand new to WordPress. In, this is why I love this WordCamp because honestly, the majority of people who attend are not, you know, people who have been using WordPress for many years. They're not avid, uh, you know, theme developers. They're people who have just heard about WordPress yesterday and found out that there was a WordCamp and then they, you know, decided to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. And so keep those people in mind when you're developing this stuff. So this is a great uh, uh, sort of service that launched um, just a few weeks ago. And what it does is it makes updates insanely easy for themes. So how many of you have uh, used a, a WordPress theme and found out that there was a bug in it? <coughs> so a lot of people. 
and you contact the developer, and the developer says, uh, oh yeah, we released an update for that like three weeks ago, and you're like, man, I must have missed that memo, I didn't get that. So if you're not, if you're not using uh, you know, the, the WordPress.org repo to sort of manage uh, your versions or anything like that uh, for your themes and plugins, and maybe you're a theme shop or you're selling on Mojo themes or you're selling on uh, ThemeForest or, or some of these other distribution channels, it's really hard to, to get these updates out to your users. And so uh, this is a site uh, that you basically upload a zip file, you drop in some PHP code um, into your, if you're using a theme, it's your functions.php file, and if it's a plugin, it's just your main plugin file. <coughs> and all it does is it basically references the current version, uh, whatever you have uh, installed, and uh, basically says, hey, does this user use this current version? If not, it does a little, um, you know, would you like to update, and it just uh, activates it or downloads it right uh, from the start as if, you know, it was on WordPress.org in uh, the, either the theme or the plugin repo. So make it easy for people to keep updating with your themes. Make it easy for them to get updates to, you know, some of these premium plugins that people are using. So the next thing is sort of application best practices. So again, when you're, when you're approaching this development, recognize that the chances are that a lot of the plugins that you develop are gonna be used by more than just you. And keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that you have to be passionate about what you're developing or else it's gonna turn out like crap. And our data at Press Trends is gonna show that. It's gonna be like, man, this has an insanely high abandonment rate. Uh, the, the conversion rate is low for comments. It gets an insane amount of spam or it, it just breaks. Make sure what you're developing is easy to consume by the users. Make it as easy as WordPress, right? The, the foundational belief system in, when we're creating these uh, themes and plugins is that we're creating extensions to WordPress, right? So how people experience WordPress is really based not only on WordPress core, but also the themes and the plugins that we use. And so just keep all of that in, uh, in mind as you're approaching it. Now getting into sort of uh, the application. <coughs> The most important thing, I think, is obviously to test. I think you know, a lot of developers uh, who started using uh, WordPress learned how to develop just by using WordPress, right? We sort of you know, figure out uh, you know, PHP hooks and filters and all these sort of, uh, all this sort of uh, things. And I think it's super important to test and, and to figure out how to do certain things uh, and, and, and learn new functions and see what works and see what doesn't work. But it's equally as important to start with a solid foundation. And you know, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about frameworks and, and their sort of beliefs about frameworks, but here's the deal. Honestly, if a framework like Bootstrap or, or the Genesis framework or some of these other popular frameworks are gonna do all of the work for you and you get to focus on just building a great user experience or building the functionality that you want, whatever, use it, like it's there. It obviously, uh, you know, a wide range of people use it, and even Automatic created a framework that you can use. And it's a framework theme called Underscores. And you can go to this uh, underscores.me and you can download it. <coughs> and essentially what this framework is really good in doing is it sets a solid foundation and it includes all of the WordPress uh, sort of key functionality. So I know, you know some of the sessions earlier today, they talked about how it's a pain in the butt to go through and set all of the core WordPress functions, right? To make sure that uh, you have author bios and you have all the meta tags and you have uh, everything set up that, that WordPress requires you to do. You can start with the framework like underscores and it does all of that for you so that you can start focusing on you know, sort of the front end or maybe doing additional custom post types that if you wanna do additional functionality like sliders or events or products or anything like that. It's so important to start with a good, function, uh, a, a good so, uh, sort of solid foundation. Uh, there's this other framework uh, that's launching pretty soon called Schematic. <coughs> and what Schematic does, it, it sort of builds upon the underscores framework, so it includes all of sort of the core uh, uh, functionality and, and the requirements that you get in WordPress uh, that sort of automatic would require, but at the same time, it incorporates the uh, entire bootstrap library. And so it takes all of what uh, we've learned today with Bootstrap and it puts everything uh, just right at your fingertips through um, you know, different hooks and filters, 
um, and just a, a wide uh, range of, of stuff. And actually, the developer of this is uh, Matt Jones, which is over there. So if you have any questions or, or, or want to get a, you know, want to try it out or, or anything like that, talk to him. So start with a solid foundation. There's no harm in, in you know, getting a, a solid framework done. And honestly, if you go talk to the Mojo Themes guys, they'll say, you know, just start with a good foundation, right? It makes our jobs a lot easier because we know that everything within WordPress core is available and it just creates a much uh, smarter and, and easier to use theme. The next is use actions and filters. So actions and filters <coughs> are, are sort of uh, are a subset of what WordPress offers as hooks. Now hooks are a way that when you develop a plugin or a theme allows you to sort of hook into the core functionality of WordPress. And so actions and filters allow you to basically add on to these hooks and, and, and uh, do some pretty interesting things. And I'm not going to go too far into this because all of the information, if you just go to the WordPress codex, you can find every uh, hook that's available, every action, how to modify it. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, one of them later. But going on is uh, load scripts and CSS with WP and Q script and WP and Q style. An example of this uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, you just set basically a function, you say NQ CSS, you can name it whatever, and then you just do WP NQ style or WP NQ script. You set the handle, the file source. So this is how you should load all your JavaScript and all your CSS. And the reason to do that, especially with, uh, if say if you're doing jQuery, is that when you do this, it, it, it's uh, WordPress automatically loads jQuery into no conflict mode. And so if you don't know exactly what that means, it basically means that it doesn't use the dollar sign sort of objective. It uses uh, jQuery instead of the dollar sign. It makes it so that all of the uh, sort of JavaScript and, and jQuery libraries are compatible. And this is a great way to manage uh, basically conflicts that you're going to run into within the front end. So the next thing is if you can, Use existing functions in WordPress core instead of writing your own. Man, WordPress has a ton of built-in functions, and I'm discovering new ones every single day. And so uh, if you visit the WordPress codex and you have a question about, you know, I, I want to do this with a, with a particular function, you can just type it in, and nine times out of ten, there's already a function or a hook that you can tie right into that WordPress are, are we, uh, already does. So the next thing is uh, ensure plugins generate no errors with WP debug. <coughs> so I know we've already talked about this. Chris kind of highlighted this. The best way to do it is to go to your wp-config.php file, find where it says wp uh, underscore debug, and set the constant to true. And uh, Chris kind of went over this, but basically we'll report what errors you have with your plugin or even with your theme. So the next thing, uh, which we kind of already went over today, is use the settings API. Um, and this is sort of a quick uh, little snippet of uh, PHP that kind of gets the job done. So uh, there's this hook that says add settings field. You set the ID, uh, the title of the settings field that you're looking for, the callback, the page, um, uh, what section. So if you're doing uh, sort of multiple setting sections, you can say, I want it to be in uh, maybe the SEO settings instead of maybe the uh, Google Analytics settings. And then you can uh, basically set what the arguments are inside of an array. And if you visit the codex, Word, uh, the sort of the WordPress codex, it will guide you through on setting, um, maybe I want to do different uh, settings fields and, and how those are saved to the database uh, within the array. So does, has anybody ever heard of this before? All right, sweet. <clears throat> so this is a major best practice. And uh, until about three months ago, I never did it in any of my plugins. Um, and I was working with a guy named Mark Jakewith who does a lot of uh, sort of development on core. And uh, he turned me on to this. And, and uh, so what this is, is it basically uh, sets all the output streams um, to allow for inter, uh, inter, internationalization of all of your text. So even if you're only going to use uh, the plugin and you don't think that many people are, again, the nature of WordPress is that most people are going to find it if you, you know, put it in sort of the repo. 
Um, and you know, there might be cases where they want to use it in a different language. And so the easiest way to do this <coughs> is for your variables to wrap it around in parentheses and then just set it with an underscore. And that's all you have to do. WordPress does the rest. It's insanely easy. This allows people to upload different language files and automatically hook into uh, you know, making your themes or plugins uh, a lot more available in different languages. The other way to do it is to uh, set underscore E. And that way, if you just, uh, this basically says, hey, just echo whatever this output is. So whatever you put in here, if somebody has another language file, WordPress will automatically recognize it and just, uh, uh, you know, they can use sort of their language file to translate it. If you don't do this, then what other people are left to do is go in line by line, search every line of code, figure out all the streams, and uh, either format it to this or go through and rewrite um, all of the, uh, the streams to the language that they're looking to do. The other thing is this, access web services uh, intelligently. So this means Facebook, it means Twitter, it means other companies like mine with, you know, with uh, different APIs. <coughs> and the best way to do it is not through setting up any sort of curl or uh, any other sort of, uh, sort of uh, PHP um, tricks that you would use. The best way to do it within WordPress is to use the function that's already built in. And that function is WP remote get and also WP remote post. And so here's an example. Uh, you basically set a response variable and you say WP remote get, you have the URL and then you can set an array of different uh, sort of settings for, in this instance, it's just a timeout. The next thing is with this, don't be evil, right? WordPress has a ton uh, of great hooks and you can tie in a bunch of uh, third party sort of integrations and applications. And there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with WP Remote Git and WP Remote Post. But there's a lot of really bad things that you can do with it. For instance, you can grab, say, the admin's email address and you can send it back to your server. Or you can uh, uh, grab, uh, you know, user specific data and send it back to your server or do different things like that. So with great responsibility comes great power, don't be evil. So these are sort of like an overview of best practices uh, when developing for WordPress, not necessarily from uh, a heavy sort of code or application perspective, but more from theory because I've seen so many themes and plugins be developed that you know, don't, aren't wrapped in a class, don't use functions, uh, they include scripts just automatically, uh, they do WP remote get to uh, various uh, really seemingly evil uh, sort of third party applications, uh, their uh, streams are internationalized. It's so important that you start out with a firm foundation, that you're approaching it from the right way, and if you just follow these sort of core principles when developing, and always make sure to interact with sort of the WordPress codex. You should be okay. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it, but we will save that for another day. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. I can't see anybody right here, so <laughs> if there's a question, someone shout out. Yes. Um, like what specifically? So I got one. So, so how many of you? How many of you sell themes or plugins? Oh wow. Okay. Well, then that statistic won't be very helpful. Um, I don't know. What's what's some statistics that you guys would be interested in? I, I want to hear the sales uh, statistic. You want to hear? Okay. So the sales statistic is this. A lot of people say. Um, man, I want to sell my theme uh, or plugin. What's the best way to go about it? So the best way that we've seen from data is that the companies that straight offer a premium theme traditionally uh, don't have uh, as much adoption, right? Because one, the barrier to entry is usually around $49, whereas somebody who's going into the WP.org repo has a barrier entry of $0, right? They can just activate it and it's, and it's there. Um, tr also, what we've seen is that 
premium themes uh, as opposed to free themes um, traditionally have a lower abandonment percentage. So uh, that might be just because you know, they're putting more effort into it. Um, but what we've also seen is the best way to make money is to offer a free theme. You get the widest set of adoption and then to offer a pro version. So say uh, a great example of this is a company called Cyberchimps. Um, and they have a, uh, a theme in the WordPress.org uh, repo. Um, and uh, I mean, they have insane adoption on this, right? Because they have uh, sort of tapped into that distribution channel. Um, and while the abandonment might be <coughs> a little bit high, um, they are able to uh, sort of migrate a large portion of those people who are using their free theme into their paid version. And then once they get to the paid version, they're less likely to abandon the theme because they've already sort of uh, interacted with it. They understand uh, how it's working and they understand sort of what they're getting with it. Um, so it just, kind of, uh, it just kind of depends in terms of what you're looking for uh, in terms of you know, monetizing and different things like that. Same is true for plugins. Yes, the same, uh, same is true for plugins. One thing that we've realized is, um, so here's, here's a, a good example. So how many of you have ever heard of Gravity Forms? Great. How many of you use Gravity Forms? Can't really see it now as much. Okay. <coughs> how many of you have heard of and use Contact Form 7? OK, so a little bit more. <coughs> so that's what we found. We found that at some point, you have to make a decision. Do you want to get your product out there to as many people as possible um, and maybe make money on, on, on the upgrades or you know, potentially get people to upgrade to a paid version? Or do you want to have not as many customers and not as many users, but at least every one of them is paying? So we found like Contact Form 7 has, man, like 13 uh, times more uh, sites using it than, say, Gravity Forms. Like, we rank all of the sort of plugins in, by usage, not really downloads, but you know, by actual activations. And Gravity Forms is way down on the list, whereas Contact Form 7 is in the top 25. So I would say it's, it's definitely true with plugins, um, as it is with themes, that you kind of have to approach it from what you're hoping to get out of it in terms of you know, sales, adoption, different things like that. Do, 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 do. Any other questions? Yeah? Six. <coughs> What's really? Six? Yep. <laughs> I don't know why. It's What's just. The, uh, the, how, are, are there any plugins or themes, probably, this is more of a plugin question, who after the free download are aggressively marketing the pro upgrade or do they passively market? Um, so I don't know just because we don't have the full sort of data integration to see that because a lot of times the only way that we track it is, I'll give you an example. So like with the events calendar, uh, they have the events calendar and then they have the events calendar pro. And so for us, we're, we're able to see that uh, more than 10% of people uh, who have uh, used the events calendar are, are then you know, using the Events Calendar Pro within a period of, of 30 days. Um, but we're not really tracking how they're going about getting those people to upgrade. Um, some people have, like, if you look at you know, the Events Calendar, if you look at uh, Yoast WordPress SEO, like, they always have like, different uh, widgets that they kind of put in, in the dashboard, or maybe they have a, um, a, uh, a different thing that says, hey, there's a pro version, see what the features are. Um, I will say this. <coughs> um, what we've seen, at least lately, in terms of transitioning uh, or, or monetizing a plugin is the best way to do it is through extensions. That is the best way to do it. Um, I'll give you a great example. So WooCommerce, right? They launched it, and uh, they launched it as a free. Uh, you can still get WooCommerce for free. But then if you want to add different features to it, like say you want to get different uh, payment gateways or 
um, you know, whatever features that would exist within an e-commerce platform. Uh, platform, um, they sell it as extensions, and so these extensions range anywhere from you know a few bucks to you know a hundred dollars at times. But <clears throat> what not only do you get the widespread adoption of the plugin, but you also make a ton of money off the uh, sort of extension sales because people are looking, they love the plugin, and they're just looking for this uh, one additional feature, and they're looking to get that feature which also helps in the user experience because you're not adding a bunch of features that people have to navigate through because they're not going to use. They're only getting sort of the base product and then they're getting exactly what features that they want and you're still able to monetize. So everyone's happy. And also the the, we found that the abandonment rate is a lot lower too because it's just simpler to use. It does exactly what it says to do. Um, and if there's a feature that you're looking for that doesn't have it, you can easily go out and just purchase it. So, yes? You mentioned schematic. If, if you install schematic, does it automatically install Bootstrap? Yes. It comes bundled with it. Point out again who, who Matt Jones is. Oh, you, okay. I like how there's like three people who raise their hands. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever point. I have a question. Yes. I should have just done a talk on press trends. It would have been a lot, <laughs> probably better. Maybe next time. What was the question again? So I just want to know what, what like, a good, what's normal if you offer say, like a free plugin and then a pro version of the plugin. What is a, what have you guys noticed to be considered like a good rate of upgrading? 11 to 15%. Um, no, it's, it's a little bit lower than themes. Um, <coughs> we, themes don't do that as much, so we don't have a large data set to really look at that, but the themes that we, we have managed are a lot lower um, than that. They're generally around like seven, seven or eight percent. Um, but with plugins, um, you know, if, if you just have a, a free version and then you have a paid version and you're not doing extensions or anything like that, it's generally around that, which is actually pretty good. Like if you run a SaaS company, uh, if you're getting 10% of users who are upgrading to uh, a paid version, you're killing it. So um, I, think it, I think it's pretty good, but I still think that when you do it in extension forms, uh, your abandon rate is lower, your adoption rate is, is uh, about the same, uh, but your revenue is usually higher. Um, and I think people generally just have a much better user experience. Yep. 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 So I mean, it's yeah. There's a lot of data around that, but I can't be the one to share it just because it's other company data. But it's yeah. It's right now that's the best way to go. My kind of goes along with you is because I I find some plugins the price really like for example Backup Buddy. Yeah. Is pretty high price, but it's very much worth it if you're moving sites or restoring or or something like grabbing forms. Mm -hmm. But like I find some others like Slide Deck, for example, is like three hundred bucks and there's a million free slider plugins out there. Right. So finding that, you know, medium to kind of find the good price point for that kind of upgraded one. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> you know, people debate whether or not uh where their prices should be. Um for us like we try to sort of benchmark it in terms of the actual category. So like there's events plugins, there's slider plugins, there's you know, different things like that. So it's hard to say across the board, like this is a target price that you should set. I think for themes, there's so many themes and that's part of the reason why we created Press Trends was that it was just getting obnoxious and there had to be a way to delineate themes other than this, is, this theme has made this much money or this theme has downloaded this many times, right? Um, but for plugins, uh, we just don't have you know those specific price points. I know for themes, it's right around thirty nine, forty nine dollars. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that's the developer's choice. I think it's more like marketplaces or just the community has sort of set that. I think if developers wanted it, it would be more like ninety nine dollars. It's interesting to find like the there's, where there's a lot of plugins that are free. Yeah. The same thing as some of these premium ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and after you spent $300, you're like, Dane, I have to make this work because I just spent like $300. Yeah. 
Yeah. And there, here's another thing. Like when you're browsing or looking for themes, don't pick one, or even plugins, don't pick one just because it's been downloaded a bunch of times. That generally doesn't mean that it's good. Um, it just means that it's been downloaded a bunch of times. That's all it is. So we've seen a lot of, uh, we, we have data that says uh, basically how many times it's been downloaded, the average time it takes to activate it, and then what's the abandonment percentage after it gets activated. And usually the ones that have a lot higher uh, sort of downloads or, or sales, if that matter, um, traditionally um, have a quick time to activation and a really high abandonment rate. So, because I think people are just making those gut, you know, sort of decisions, because um, it's a lot easier to do. Two comments on this. Sometimes I've seen a, a plugin or a theme actually drive the WordPress usage. So, an example of this might be someone who wants to build a membership site, and they've never even heard of WordPress or used it before, but someone's developed a, a, a membership plugin. Yeah. Who is, uh, you know, a really good marketer. And they sort of pitch you on the idea of a membership site, and that person, you know. So in that case, there might be free plugins and stuff that would do the same thing, but but they're marketing that totally outside of the WordPress community, and kind of converting those people into WordPress users. Would you would you uh, just comment on that? Any thoughts you have on that? So I don't know. Wow, that's a very general question. Like I think <coughs> uh, my comment would be great. Like, we have more WordPress users, you know? Um, like, a lot of people are trying to use WordPress as a platform uh, to build uh, their own platform. Does that make sense? So you have companies, you have companies like Happy Tables, which is using WordPress as a way to uh, create a, a sort of service uh, platform for restaurants to easily create, uh, uh, you know, websites. Um, and so when people find out that it's WordPress and they're selling them on the idea, hey, use WordPress, we've created this mass solution around it, um, maybe they have to pay for it, but people are still used to WordPress and uh, the more people that those companies or those platforms bring into WordPress isn't you know, a bad thing. Um, it really depends on that user experience and making sure, I think that there's more weight on those companies and those developers to provide a really great experience because they're not just interacting with WordPress, but they're assuming that WordPress is this plus whatever their plugins or whatever their platform is. And so I think it's you know, a lot more weight on their shoulders. Um, but in terms of you know, using that as a strategy, I, I'd say go for it. That's one of the great things about WordPress is that you can pretty much do whatever you want around that. No, we don't. We don't. Uh, we don't do. It. I'd like to, but um, we uh, we haven't got any response back from you know hosting companies that say, yeah, we'd be interested in, in using this. So we just don't have access to that data. We could start tracking it, but I don't know. It's really not that valuable to developers. Um, to I mean, to know that sixty percent of your you know maybe activations are using are hosted on Bluehost or. We do track that, um, and uh, so we track that. We also track like WordPress versions and also versions that are active within your uh, for your plugin or your theme, um, and so all of that is available within your dashboard. Great. <laughs>